Good morning, Jeffrey, and welcome to Communion Sunday. Let's uh, settle our hearts and prepare ourselves with these words from Psalm 119, 171 to 176. And this is what our call to worship says. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. The commands of the Lord, the laws of the Lord, are, are things that are worthy, that should draw praise from our lips, that should be our delight, that should be something that we desire. And the psalmist tells us the reason for this is that in it we find salvation, in it we find restoration for our lives. So with that, let's let, allow God to draw us into worship today. Let's praise.
once was lost. I once was lost in darkest night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy and life had led me to the grave. I had no hope that you would own a rebel to your will. And if you had not loved me first, I would refuse you still. I ran my hellbound race, indifferent to the cost. You looked upon my helpless state and led me to the cross. And I beheld God's love displayed. You suffered in my place. You bore the wrath. Reserved for me, now all I know is grace. Hallelujah, all I have is Christ. Hallelujah, Jesus is. alone and lift so all might see the strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you hallelujah all i have is christ hallelujah jesus is for those who trust in you, a shield for those who trust in you. Everything. Everything will fade, everything will fade, heavens and the earth will pass away, but you will remain, yes you will remain always. Feet. 
your promises won't fail me now. The Word of God. The Word of God is light in my darkness. Hope for the hopeless, strong and true. The word of God is strength for the weary, a shield for those who trust in you, a shield for those who trust in you. Everything. Everything will fade, everything will fade. Heavens and the earth will pass away, but you will remain, yes, you will remain always. Good morning, church. Today's scripture reading will be taken from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. I will be reading from the English Standard Version. At the end of the reading, I will close off and say, this is the word of the Lord. And I invite you to unmute briefly and respond saying, thanks be to God. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house tremble and, when, and the strong men are bent and the grinders cease because they are few and those who look through the windows are dimmed and the doors on the street are shut. When the sound of the grinding is low and one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of song are brought low. They are afraid also of what is high, and terrors are in the way. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags itself along, and desire fails because man is going to his eternal home, and the mourners go about the streets before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is scattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. 
The preacher sought to find words of delight, and uprightly he wrote words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, be aware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter, all, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether or evil. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, we're concluding our series on the book of Ecclesiastes, where we've come to better grasp the limitations in this life. Whether it's wisdom or folly, righteousness or sin, all will pass. The days will end. And so reading this book in isolation and in a cursory way can be pretty depressing, but I assure you it is a hope-filled message that ultimately points us to the Lord. And so before we begin today, let us pray together. Our great God, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for the truth that is in scripture and how you have revealed yourself and you've revealed the truth about this world. We pray, Father, that you would meet with us this morning, that your truth would be spoken, your name would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. And so with summer coming to an end, we've concluded our Trail Mix VBS, our Trail Mix Vacation Bible School uh, for the summer now. And I want to extend our gratitude uh, to all of you who have been praying for us, supporting us, uh, who came out to the barbecue and, and cooked for us or helped us in any way. Because the team and I had a front row seat to how God revealed his love to the children this summer. And we know that it's because of your faithful partnership in the Lord that we were able to do this together. And so during this summer, we studied uh, creation uh, and through creation came to understand God's character like his creativity or his sovereignty as seen through creation. The leaders the staff, they helped me revisit much of what I had already forgotten in biology classes in years past, like animals at the depths of the ocean, uh, things like the water cycle I needed to be familiar with, the ways in which God provided shelter for the animals. On one occasion, I was leading a discussion with the youngest group. The youngest group it composes of kindergartners to grade two students, and I was telling the kids about this one animal, ask them, what's this one animal that changes its home, changes its shell? And in a moment of panic, I couldn't remember the answer to my own question, and I said, it's a snail, right guys? And immediately, I could see on the, the animal expert in our, in our K to grade two group, the, bemused, the, the look of confusion on her face, and her hand immediately shot up. And I already realized, of course, I must have given the wrong information. And so I asked her, yes, what is it, my dear? And she corrected me in the kindest, but also the most assertive way that it, they were, in fact, hermit crabs, not snails that changed their shells. And so clearly, I benefited from this camp both as a leader and at times as a participant. And so today we'll continue our study of Ecclesiastes where we'll also be touching on the theme, heavily touching on the theme of God as creator. It seems that this is an ongoing theme that the Lord wants more than a few of us to sit with this summer. And so we've made our way through this book of Ecclesiastes and there are two speakers in this book. There is the preacher or the teacher who has given these wise sayings, and there is the author who has compiled all of the teacher's wise sayings. And we're going to hear from both parties today. But the wise teacher of Ecclesiastes 
uh, begins our passage today in chapter 12, verse 1, by saying, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. The instruction is to remember your Creator. This is the first explicit mention of the Creator in the entire text of Ecclesiastes. What an interesting way to conclude this book. For those that have written essays, you know not to introduce some new point at the end of your essay. And it seems strange to introduce what on the surface looks like a new idea at the very end of this writing. But while this is the first explicit mention of the Creator God, for those that have been keeping up with our sermon series, you will recognize that this theme of God's sovereignty has been woven throughout and is seen implicitly through the rest of the book of Ecclesiastes. From the description in chapter 1 about the vanity of life under the sun, to how God has given every season in chapter 3 a time to, to give birth, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot, a time to kill, and so on and so forth. The greater work and the sovereignty of God has been an undercurrent throughout the text. And so although this is the first explicit mention of the Creator God to remember our Creator, this is not the first time the wise teacher has touched on this. So what does it mean for us to remember your Creator? Not simply the Creator, but your Creator. It begins with recognizing that the Creator is sovereign Lord. Through His speaking, all things came into existence. Nothing was, and then He spoke, and then all things were. He created all things. He breathed His breath of life into humanity. He looked and saw that all that He had made was good. He declared that all creation was good. And so remembering God includes remembering his sovereign control over life and death, his control over people's fortunes, their well-being, and the fact that he will judge every individual and make all things beautiful in their appropriate time. It's in remembering God as our creator that we recognize what some theologians call his otherness, his otherworldliness. God is completely other, distinct from us. He is completely otherworldly. Not to say that he is physically distant from us, but that, that our categories, the way in which we speak, are simply unable to truly capture his infinitude and his splendor. They just scratch the surface. And so what happens for myself, and maybe this is true of you, is that we may misperceive our being created in the image of God, which is certainly true. We may misperceive that as us being miniature versions of him, like those Russian nesting dolls. We're just the smallest one, and maybe God's just a few nesting dolls removed from us. We miscast ourselves as miniature gods, lower G gods, not too far removed from the real thing. And so it made me wonder, and perhaps this analogy is more apt as we consider ourselves rather than as these nesting dolls that are just a few steps removed from the creator's image. But perhaps it's more like this. If I were to make my way to the Atlantic East Coast and I were to hold a glass of salt water as I looked out at the Atlantic Ocean. Can you imagine as I held out this glass of salt water, my glass of salt water, and I can see and I can hear the powerful waves crashing up against the rocks. Or maybe I wade into the water and I venture further and further out, first to my ankles, then to my knees, then to my shoulders, and eventually where my feet can no longer touch the ground. Thanks to the teachers of this year's VBS, I learned so much about the depths of the ocean where we have yet to even explore and experience. Perhaps this understanding of the Atlantic Ocean, of any ocean, 
This is the comparison that we have of ourselves merely as a glass of salt water as we overlook the vastness of who God is. And so to understand God simply as a larger version of us forgets God's otherness and his magnitude. A.W. Tozer says this, Left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. Let me say that again. Left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. Even in my analogy of the ocean to our glass of salt water, that's a way for us to understand God. And so when I say that God is good, kind, loving, steadfast, Perhaps my first thought is to liken this trait to someone that I know, someone who is very good, someone who's very kind, very loving, steadfast. But God is much more than that. He is ultimate good, ultimate kind, ultimate loving, ultimate steadfast. He is the purest version and form of each of these things in their highest place. The otherness of God informs and inspires our worship. Because when we forget God's otherness, when we forget the magnitude of God's glory, we settle for worshiping lesser things. Instead, we worship other created things, things that are on the same created order of us, as us. We worship people. We worship man-made things. We worship worldviews rather than the one who has spoken these things into existence. The Apostle Paul explains in Romans chapter 1 that all of creation reveals the divine nature of God. Our worship is misplaced when we worship anything but God. We trade the vastness of the ocean deeps for that cup of, gla- cup of salt water that we hold and control in our hand. That's the difference. We have to trade our sinful worship of good things for God who is the greatest one. And so that's the instruction at the very beginning. Remember your creator. Remember your creator. The teacher of Ecclesiastes goes on to explain in this same verse, in verse 1, that remembering your creator, holding on to God's otherworldly sovereignty is what shapes the paradigm, the way of thinking for our life. It's imperative to have this framework as soon as possible in the days of your youth and before the evil days come. The Christian Standard Bible, another version of the Bible, translates these evil days as the days of adversity. Prior to the pandemic, I was helping out as a group leader at a conference called Teens Conference. Uh, Many of you are familiar with this conference. And because of the scale of this conference, the youth that attended were separated into separate or different teams. Uh, This was prior to the pandemic, so it was in person. And I vividly remember a conversation my team of grade 7 and 8 youth were having. One of the grade, I think grade 8 boys, was adamant in telling his peers that their best days were ahead of them, and that their physical peak would hit when they were in their mid-20s. And I remember listening with interest and thinking, wow, what wisdom of this 13, 14-year-old boy. And so I leaned in to listen a bit more, and he went on to say this, and to preface this, I will say, I am simply quoting or paraphrasing him, He said, after your peak in your 20s, it's all downhill after 30. Over 30, I felt I needed to interject, perhaps to shake him up so that, you know, he might apologize, recant, retract his statement. And I said, well, you know, I'm over 30, right? He didn't retract his statement. Instead, he doubled down. He looked me straight in the eye, I remember this, and he said, well, then you must agree. It's gotten worse. Stunned, I could only nod in agreement and say, yeah, it has gotten worse. 
And so life in my 30s has been harder than life in my 20s. And I'm not old by any stretch of the imagination, but even I know a little about the aging process. My body is a little more sore nowadays. It takes a little longer to recover. I need a bit more sleep. As, and as I'm saying these things to you, I'm sure that there are some of you that are older than me that are wishing, man, I wish I was still in my 30s, just as I hear you see, say those things. And so the days of evil or the days of adversity aren't some young teenager calling you out at a Christian conference, no matter how, you know, matter how challenging that is. The days of adversity are, how, are the days of aging. The teacher is describing the aging process here. Having started in chapter 1 of Ecclesiastes with a poem describing the fleeting nature of life under the sun, the book concludes with a poem describing the aging process. As Vivian read for us this morning, from verses 1 to 7, the teacher launches into a very graphic and lengthy description of the deterioration of life and the debilitating effects of old age. It's a very sobering read. Death is inevitable. Age catches up to all of us. Those debilitating effects won't escape us. And so this depiction of old age and the aging process is grounded in the teacher's instruction to remember the creator. Remember your creator. The poem in verses 1 to 7 directly contrasts with our God who is ageless and tireless. The psalmist sings in Psalm chapter 90 verse 4, A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Our time on this earth is but a blink of an eye to an infinite God who stands outside of time. He doesn't grow tired of answering prayer requests. He doesn't get tired of tending to the world, as some might get tired of responding to emails or taking care of our families. God is ageless and timeless in contrast to us limited and finite beings who will be and are affected by the aging process. And so that's why after this lengthy poem, the teacher launches into his 40th time of saying, vanity of vanities, this is verse 8, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. A few weeks ago, Pastor Bernard shared with us the Bible Project's explanation of this word vanity or havel, and it made quite an impression on me. Havel meaning to grasp at smoke. That's the literal translation of the word, and this this is the nature of the world that we live in. It is Havel. It is impossible to grasp. Whether we have much or have little, have wisdom or folly, all will pass. And death is inevitable. And life's meaning is never very clear. Life, like smoke, is visible to the eye. And it might even take shape in front of us like smoke. But it's impossible to grasp and apprehend. It's confusing. It's disorienting. It's uncontrollable. It's not formulaic where A leads to B, where if you do this and you work hard, life is not a meritocracy. We may have our life plans mapped out, hoping to advance from one life stage to the next. And naturally, we desire good things, right? We desire good grades, a good career, good family, good retirement, good grandkids, and and good health mixed in there. And don't get me wrong, these are good and worthwhile prayer items for ourselves and for other people. But if that is all that we are striving for in this life, if that's our greatest concern, happiness and well-being, then my friends, we have missed the mark. Because what happens when these prayers go unanswered, when life doesn't go the way that we want, what happens when the answer to our prayers are delayed or answered are in different ways that we didn't anticipate. What does our relationship with the Lord look like in those moments? The author tackles these questions 
in a very different way. Having captured what the teacher has said and shared in the volume of Ecclesiastes, it is the author who has the final word, the author who's compiled all these sayings, who has the final word. And he shares about the value of wisdom in verse 11. The words of the wise, you know, the questions that the teacher of Ecclesiastes has raised, the words of the wise are like goads, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. A goad or a cattle prod was a small spike at the end of the shepherd's staff. As the name cattle prod suggests, it was used to poke and prod the cattle or sheep into the right direction. And so the words that the teacher has shared about the havel or vanity of life, they point us in the right direction. The wisdom found in Ecclesiastes points to our lives needing greater meaning than that which we can only grasp at and and miss. The author sums this up in verses 13 and 14. The author says this, The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Earlier, the teacher in his final words had said, to remember your creator. And we spoke about God and his infinitude, about how he alone is the creating one. We see the author bringing together the relevance of remembering God as creator in verse 13 with the description of mankind's duty. The whole duty or the whole function of mankind is to fear God. When our paradigm, when our way of thinking and our way of life is informed by the sovereignty, the other, otherworldliness of our creator God, then we can understand our place in his created order. Our function and our whole duty, just as it was given for men and women to have dominion over all of the earth, when we understand our function in the created order, we see that our whole duty, as the author says, is to fear God and keep his commandments. This, my friends, is the ultimate goal And this should be our greatest striving. We need to pray in this direction. The other things we're praying for, that's fine and that's good and God welcomes them. But we need to pray in this direction. Because when we fail to see God as sovereign creator, we certainly won't fear God. And we won't keep his commandments. I know this is true of myself. When I lose God's sovereignty, when I forget God's sovereignty, when it's so much more about what I can do, what I can manage, what I can produce with my hands and my hard work, when it's all about me and my hard work and my happiness, then I get angry, disappointed, jaded in my faith. But when my primary motive in this life my primary function as believer, as Jesus' as God's beloved, is to fear God and keep his commandments, everything else falls in line. Like the sheep in need of a cattle prod or a goad, we need the wisdom found in Ecclesiastes. We need the truth of Scripture, of the chief shepherd, to lead us and herd us into the right direction. Solomon explains in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Fear of the Lord leads to wisdom. That, that is the paradigm, the ability to live in this life. Knowledge of the Holy One informs our worship, deepens our worship, because the one who knows God the Father, who has really spent time in the Word and in prayer, naturally, they will fear God. And so, what is this fear? To the unbeliever who may not know it, there is a real fear of God. To the unbeliever, this fear lies in the presence of a holy God who will mete out justice and do punishment at the end of ages. 
However, for those who are in Christ, the cross transforms this fear of the Lord's punishment into hope. Christians can approach Judgment Day with confidence and hope in Jesus Christ. Pastor and theologian John Piper says this, and I think that is what the cross is. Jesus died for us to provide a place where we could enjoy the majesty of God with a kind of fear and trembling and reverence and awe, but not a cowering fear. The cross of Jesus Christ transforms this fear where we can fully appreciate the majesty of God without fear of eternal punishment and his wrath. The cross transforms this fear for us. And so for the believer, fear is approaching the throne of God with humility, lowliness, and a sensitivity of heart. It holds on to the sheer majesty of God, as well as his holiness, justice, power, and wrath. And when we approach this holy God, it it can't be flippant or cavalier. It's understanding where we are in the created order. And so... To tie all this together, the book of Ecclesiastes has been a very sobering read, right? We see the fragility of life. We see how uncontrollable the circumstances may be. And outside of Christ, this is a hopeless and despairing book. But as as the wise teacher says, when we remember the creator God, when we see we have a literal godsend in Jesus that is outside of time and outside of our experience, when we have someone coming into our experience like that, then we have real hope. The despair found in Ecclesiastes, the, the, the harsh realities found in Ecclesiastes, they don't have the last word. And so the author rightly directs our attention that it is about focusing and fixing our eyes on a sovereign God in which we can trust and rely. Because after, with many strokes, painting this bleak picture of life, this book of Ecclesiastes is setting the stage, setting the stage for a hope-filled life that can only be found in Christ alone. Where as we sang this morning, it comes down to all I have is Christ. And that is the firm foundation that we can stand on. It reveals, this book reveals all that is lacking in life. All that, all the shortcomings of this life. And it doesn't hide the solution. The solution is clear. Worship and fear of the creator God who has sent his son. That's how we make our way through the harsh realities of this life, of how unfair and how unjust life can feel, of how despairing and how hard it is. It is holding on to our fear of the Lord. It is keeping his commandments. It is worshiping him. And so when I sit with this book, I recognize the trivialities of this life, and it helps fix my eyes on eternity. It helps me realizing that I am just grasping at smoke. And so I praise the Lord for the sending of his son so that at the end of our days, we have full confidence that we have been covered by the shed blood of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And so brothers and sisters, hardship will come in this life, but let us pray in the direction for us to see the vanity, the havel of this life. Let us sit with the King of kings and Lord of lords who has made himself available to us and let us worship him with healthy fear and reverence. Let us pray. Great and almighty God, beautiful in your majesty and splendor, completely otherworldly and separate and distinct from us, God, you have made yourself entirely available to us through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to remember our position in this created order. 
Help us to remember what it is that you have given us, that they are good things in this life, but they are not ultimate and great things. We should not worship these things. And so, Lord, help attune our hearts, fix our eyes on you, Jesus, and to worship you alone. Give us a greater capacity. Give us a greater desire. Help us to catch a glimpse of more and more of your glory and your character each and every day and that that would be sufficient and enough to drive and lead us through this life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now is the time for communion. I'll invite Pastor Ken. As Pastor Gabe has just preached to us, from Ecclesiastes, the whole duty of man is to fear God and obey the commandments. Um, but the challenge has been that we are unable to do this as fallen human beings, and that's why, as Pastor Gabe mentioned in the sermon, our hope is in Jesus Christ. As we lead into this time of communion, let me read from 2 Corinthians 6, 21, or sorry, 5, 21. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. In Christ, we receive that righteousness, that right standing with God of fearing him and of obeying the commandments. So as we enter into a time of communion, let us take a moment now just to Come before God with a clean heart. Come before God consecrated. Let's spend some time just in reflection and confession as we are about to receive that new life, that righteousness in Jesus Christ through the communion. So would you take a minute now of reflection and of prayer as you prepare to receive the communion? And during this time, I'm just going to give the communion elements to those who are in, in our church with us right now. On the night that Jesus had his Passover with his disciples, he took the bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body broken for you. Let's partake of the bread of righteousness. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured it and he said, this is the new wine, the wine of the new covenant. Let us partake of the wine of Christ's blood shed for us so that we could have forgiveness of sin and new life. Let's partake of the cup together. Now let's enter a time of offering. I'd like to read from Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8 uh, for our time of offering. Sacrifice and offering you have not desired, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come. 
In the scroll of the book, it is written of me, I desire to do your will, O God, O my God. Your law is within my heart. Our offering time is not simply a ritual or a good habit of bringing our money to God. God, in fact, does not need our money. As Pastor Gabe has shared today, God is the creator God. He has created everything in this universe. What God does desire of us is that we desire to do his revealed will, that his law is within our hearts, that we are in a right standing, a right relationship with God. And the context here of Psalm 40 is trust. He desires to do the revealed will of God. The law is in his heart because he trusts in God. So as we bring, when we bring our offering, whether it is money or whether it is our time or whether it is our resources, whether it is the things that we love, what God desires is that we trust him. It's an offering where we trust God. So as we enter into this time of bringing before God our offerings, let's bring it with trusting God, with desiring to do his revealed will, with the law in our hearts. Let's pray together. God, we are bringing this offering before you of money, but also of whatever we have in our hands today, whether it is our time, whether it is the people that you've brought into our lives, whether it is um, our resources. God, we want to do it. We want to be able to offer this to you, not simply because we're just trying to be good, but Lord, we want to offer this to you knowing that we know you, we trust you. We know that we can give these things, Lord, because you are trustworthy, you are faithful. You are the creator God who is above it all. So God, we come before you not simply out of habit or of ritual, but we come worshiping who you are. You are the creator God, the one who is to be feared, whose commandments are worthy to be obeyed because they are for our good and for our blessing. God, we just thank you for who you are. We want to do this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite Pastor Gabe up one more time to give us our benediction. Through Jesus Christ, he has made God in his entirety. He's revealed God to us. He's revealed through the sending of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, it is, it is in this direction that we want to pray and give thanks. So let us receive this benediction from Second Peter this morning. Let us pray together. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Lord, would knowing Jesus be sufficient grace and peace to carry us through each day as we hold fast to you, hide in your truths, and fear you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Great worshiping with you this morning. Uh, please stay tuned for the announcements uh, that will be appearing very soon. Be blessed. <laughs>